have one, a bit of a question though, for each of our three panelists. And I'll start with, with Alexandra. And this is just, you know, based on the, just with your presentation from today. Um, if there's one takeaway that you'd want the audience to, to remember, uh, what, would it, what would it be, Alexandra? I think I'd want us to plan ahead very consciously um, mm -hmm. for, you know, what's going to happen with climate change. And I want us to look at and better understand the science that is out there. So we need people to look at that science and put that into words that are more accessible for the general public. What about you, Nevin? Oh, I, I agree with a lot with a lot of that. Um, yeah, I think uh, communication is going to be key. And I think that as the science is uh, very certain on climate change is real, but um, I think making sure that it's communicated properly is still going to be a big thing coming into the future. Johanna? Yeah, we're totally all on the same page. Uh, we are just going to see more extreme weather events, but communicating mm -hmm. the science of that and making sure our audience, whatever that audience looks like, uh, you know, trusts that we are giving you the facts and the latest science is going to be so important. Okay, well, on that note, um, one of the questions that have uh, that has come in, how do you know if an extreme weather event is affected by climate change? And I'll pose this question to Johanna. This is a great question. Uh, you know, when I first started in the Weather Center 15 years ago, meteorologists definitely tried to stay away from climate change. And, you know, I remember when we'd get asked that question, we'd all, all sort of say, well, you can't take one weather event and connect it to climate change. You have to step back and look at a bigger trend. And that is still true. But the baseline of weather has shifted. Our seasonal averages have all shifted in the past decade. Our, our uh, Canada's average temperature has already warmed two degrees since the Industrial Revolution. So, you know, every day our weather has already been impacted by that shift. Uh, but what I'm really excited about is that scientists are able to rapidly connect an extreme weather event to climate change, which is something that we're seeing more and more. For example, the big heat dome that we saw out here in the summer and the floods, we had a group of climatologists uh, use climate modeling to say that that heat dome was 150 times more likely to have happened because of climate change. And I think that tangible connection and putting a number to it um, is going to be really important for people to make that connection. So I'm hoping that we see that more and more after a weather event, uh, climatologists are able to tell you exactly uh, how much more likely that was because of global warming. Yeah, I remember many decades ago when the topic of global warming and climate change had, was becoming more and more you know, prominent. Uh, you know, in the community, the, the the focus was always on, you know, sea level rise and uh, the effects uh, to smaller islands. Uh, but now we are seeing that it's not just about sea level rise. It's affecting us whether you live on the coast, whether you live inland. Uh, it could be in the form of extreme rainfall events or, you know, the heat events. So certainly it is something that we all have to consider because it's going to be affecting all of us. So the next question, uh, I think I'll pose this one to Alexandra. Uh, what are some of the climate change mitigation strategies uh, that we can implement, especially for, for your community? Um, yeah, so something that people are always concerned about up here is the cost of travel. And that's something that we are going to have to plan very far ahead in the future because we need additional infrastructure to have, you know, um, if people are going to switch to electric vehicles, which is, you know, the, the plan for the country to have everyone switch over to EVs um, in the next, like, you know, 10, 20 years, something like that, or at least be considering it. Um, so we're going to need to have that infrastructure put in. Um, you know, it's an island community and for about one to one and a half months um, at the beginning. And then again, at the end of the freeze up season, those vehicles have to sit there in the cold and it often gets to, you know, negative 30s into the low negative 40s here. Um, so it's cold and those vehicles have to retain charge and you need to be able to drive them out to the main highway again to another charge station at some point. Um, so that we need the technology to get a little bit better in EVs and we need to make sure that we have the infrastructure to support them in Northern Ontario. Charging stations are not that 
frequent up here. You know, we have some in North Bay, which is about an hour and 15 minutes south. But then when you get to Tamagni, there's only two. After that, you have to go another hour to about New Liscard. Um, so when those things get, you know, more abundant, that would be great. But we also have to consider things like retrofitting our homes so that they are more energy efficient, they retain heat better, um, they're not as you know, warm inside. So they have like air conditioning um, during the summer, that sort of thing, you know, because you have considerations for people's health, their safety and like well-being during these times of the year. So those are some things that we can do to help adapt as well. Um, for large scale mitigation, you know, that's more of a global thing. Everybody needs to reduce their GHG emissions. Canada is actually like a pretty large emitter per capita here. So everyone needs to do their part to help um, everybody in the world there. Yeah, definitely very important. Thank you so much for, for everyone to be involved. And I think that can be sometimes daunting for, you know, many individuals where they may see it as uh, something that is very overwhelming and perhaps they might not be able to have such a great impact. But everyone's actions, whether big or small, can certainly help. So I've got a next uh, question here. And this one, I'll uh, take it back to Nevin. This one was uh, from your presentation. Uh, where you showed the storm cloud. Mm -hmm. uh, so this question is um, one of the viewers wanting to know, uh, what is the name of that cloud? Yeah, really, really good question. Uh, so that storm w is what we would call a supercell. Uh, so it's a rotating thunderstorm and, and it's the kind of storm that produces the most violent kind of tornadoes. Um, but in that specific kind of framed picture, I would say it's like you're really seeing the mesocyclone and the, the wall cloud uh, associated with that. So those would be the, the two things that I would call that kind of photo. Okay. Super self. Thank you so much. Um, I'll stick with you, Nevin. Another question that has come in. Uh, do you have any tips for spotters on rain wrapped tornadoes? Oh yeah. Yeah. So that, that's something that's, uh, very dangerous when you're chasing. Uh, and if you're in the path of the storm, if you can't see the, st the tornado itself, it's very hard to avoid it. So, um, I would say my tip is to not chase very closely if, if you're if kind of faced with a, a rain wrap tornado and uh, using a lot of those tools and having that experience and, and a knowledgeable driver like Sean, um, he usually keeps us out of those kind of hairy situations. Yeah, I, I know uh, in, uh, I think, I can't remember the exact year, but there were um, very prominent storm chasers, yeah, who were uh, sadly uh, killed in, uh, I think it was a rain wrap tornado. Uh, they worked for National Geographic, so a very scary situation there. But I understand a lot of uh, storm chasers, they have very good cameras uh, that they can uh, zoom in and perhaps get a, a close-up shot without having to be, you know, very near and within danger. Uh, thank you so much for, for that answer. Uh, so this next question here, I will pose it to Johanna. Uh, with atmospheric uh, warming and uh, thunderstorms uh, rising higher in uh, altitude at their peak. So I, th I think perhaps the question is about um, maybe uh, warming temperatures and how that affects, you know, uh, thunderstorm development and the, the altitude to which they rise. Yeah, that's a really interesting question because, you know, as, as you know, then that uh, you need uh, warm air for any formation of clouds. Uh, you get that rising uh, air parcel that leads in cloud formation. And uh, the more rapid we see that rising, um, the higher the tops of those cumulus clouds. And that's where we get those thunderstorms. So it's an interesting question. Um, does atmospheric warming mean that we're getting perhaps higher thunderstorms if higher levels of the atmosphere is warming. And I know, as uh, Nevin sort of alluded to, uh, the connection between climate change and severe weather isn't as obvious as the connections that we have to other extreme weather. Uh, you know, as Alexandra was saying, we know we're getting hotter, drier wildfire seasons. We know we're going to see more flood events, but it's not as straightforward with severe weather. And that's because we're definitely going to have that one ingredient increase, which is uh, warmer temperatures. But the other ingredient, which is wind shear, which is when we have a change in wind direction or wind speed as you rise, that's the other key ingredient to thunderstorms. And we don't know exactly what climate change will do to that ingredient. So this is a, a really a current topic that climatologists and meteorologists are looking into. There's some suggestion that, uh, well, it might not necessarily mean bigger and stronger summer storms, but it is changing the season. Uh, in the US this season, we saw 
I mean, Nevin, I know this is your this is your uh, bread and butter here, but uh, we saw winter tornadoes like we never have before. And that's a possible trend when it comes to climate change is the season is changing. And we might see severe weather outside of what we consider uh, summer severe weather season. But yeah, Nevin, feel free to jump in. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think, no, I think that you nailed, nailed it. And uh, I think that for me, it's it's always like it's evolving science still. There's a lot of research still going on and it's trying to keep up with that is is pretty hard too. Um, the way that I paint it in my head is is like for, for thunderstorms is, is the storms themselves. Um, it, it's not really the storms themselves, but maybe it's the probability of some of those storm events happening. And then as, as we've seen though too, it's it's other things like, like rainfall could be in, more intense in some of these storms too. So. Okay, so we have another question here coming. I think I'll pose this one to Nevin, the storm chaser. Uh, how prevalent are tornadoes in the Southern Hemisphere versus the Northern Hemisphere and elsewhere in the world? I like this question. Uh, yeah, Northern America is pretty unique in that we do, I think, get the majority of them, but we're not exclusive. So they do happen in, in South America. Uh, even last year, we saw a lot in Europe and in places that we haven't seen before uh, some of these storms. So I think that that's uh, another interesting thing to, to research with, with the climate changing and things like that. Definitely so. Uh, I have a comment here for Alex uh, from uh, Dan Mongrain. He says, hi, Alex, we are in breakup soon and uh, with uh, possibly a week of safe travel. Excellent. Sounds like you had a long ice road season this year. I think we went from the end of December until I guess about now. <laughs> so on the, the topic of the ice road, Alex, um, I wanted to ask you, you know, in previous years, have you noticed or the members of the community in Tomogamy, have they noticed uh, significant changes uh, from years past with the the ice road, whether it be the time timing of formation or melting or uh, the thickness of the ice uh, compared from past seasons to present. Yeah, so we don't have a lot of long term data on that. But community members have, you know, talked a little bit about how the time the ice road goes in changes a little bit. So my first year up here in 2019, in it was about November 13th. And we went out and there's like three inches of ice already out on the lake there in some areas. And, you know, that was very surprising because in years after that, we didn't get ice that early. And we were, you know, people were told to, you know, stay on the island beginning of December. There's no on and off. And I know this past year, people were able to, you know, keep getting groceries into about mid-December there. But, you know, in 2019, like, um, that was a no-go. My coworker, she actually couldn't go to a conference with us because, you know, the ice was so... Um, was so thick already. So, you know, it does vary. And I think it's something that we need to keep a better eye on. For the ice road, um, you measure up until it gets to a certain thickness, and then you would stop measuring um, until, you know, the weather changes and starts warming up, and then you would start measuring it again, um, just because it becomes um, a little bit redundant, I suppose. And you know that the ice is already safe when you're, you know, uh, driving on, you know, two feet of ice already, like that's pretty significant. And you can bring quite heavy loads across on that. Um, so yeah, something that I hope that the community keeps an eye on moving forward and we keep good records and can compare and yeah, hopefully they're able to have an ice road for years to come. Hopefully. Thank you so much. I have another question, uh, with regard to, uh, what you were talking about with fire suppression. Uh, how often is this done per season? Um, how, like when we're fighting fires? Yes, with regard to sort of the mitigation when you are actually being proactive uh, in the fire season. Okay, um, so that's a province of Ontario thing. Um, not something that I have um, done myself or mm -hmm. that we've really done. We just research it and we observe what they're doing. Um, so okay. before, um, you know, in more natural times when we didn't have this amount of firefighting capacity in Ontario, you know, you would get smaller forest fires and those they'll burn out the duff layer. But because we're fighting forest fires so much now, we're kind of mm -hmm. like, we're kind of like beavers. Like we artificially change our environments. Beavers put up dams. We put up dams too. But now we are fighting these forest fires that naturally would have happened. And when we do that, um, it's kind of like accumulative effects of a lot of things. But that duff layer is building up because it's not burning. 
So now you have more of these like little leaves and twigs and dried debris that, you know, will go up in flames and they'll go up really quickly because they're not being removed, um, you know, the way they were naturally. And then, you know, it's multiple different things affecting like how frequent and how intense the forest fires year that's only like one small aspect of it we have to look at you know what are the temperatures you know like how's climate change affecting that for the future and like how much like rain are we getting that season so there's a lot of things that we need to consider in there um but that forest fire suppression and burning the death is just kind of uh, a natural thing that doesn't happen as naturally anymore because we stop it mm -hmm. oh, okay 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 well thank you uh, next question coming to us. I think I'll uh, pose this question to uh, Johanna. Uh, and perhaps, uh, Nevin, you can also chime in as well. Would making tornado warnings smaller and more like the U.S. tornado warnings make it easier to warn communities rather than our current region-based warnings? Johanna? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I'd be interested in, in your thoughts too, Nevin, because I, I think you're uh, alluding to the fact that the National Weather Service has much smaller regions and when they warn for a tornado um they really change that warning as the storm progresses they issue that watch early and then uh i mean canada environment canada uses the same concept but our regions are much larger what i've noticed is that in the text of those warnings um, environment canada forecasters do really get into where that cell was spotted what communities are next and they continually update that text um i know the topic of communicating weather warnings to Canadian audience is something that Environment Canada is thinking about right now. They want to think about ways to get that uh, message across in new ways. They're experimenting with social media. I think they know that the way that Canadians are taking in information, whether it's through uh, weather alerts or you know the new national alerting system, it's changing. That landscape is changing and they need to stay on top of that communication. So that could be one solution. I know they're looking at uh, overhauling. So um, it's, a, it's an interesting time for science communication for sure. Never. Yeah, that, that's really interesting. Um, I think you said everything I would have said. Uh, the, the only thing I would focus on that question a little bit is make it easier. And I would say forecast or trying to pinpoint tornadoes and warn people is not easy. And so I, I know that they're definitely dedicated to doing the, the, the best job they possibly can and making sure that people in the path of those storms are warned. And uh, I, I definitely trust, trust them to make the right decision, however they progress. Yeah, and I think this is uh, exactly where storm spotters come in because, like Nevin, you were saying in your presentation, those first uh, that first say few hundred uh, meters or so close to the ground, uh, the radar isn't giving us any coverage there, so we can't see what's happening. So storm hunters, uh, storm spotters, and even the general public, you know, on Twitter or any sort of social media, you know, presenting what they are seeing on the ground certainly gives us and gives Environment Canada uh, a good idea of what is actually happening and that can assist as well uh, in, in warnings in, in a particular community and in, in a localized area. We need you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Nevin. Okay, so uh, we have another question here. Uh, uh, and I'll post this one to Johanna. Uh, why have this month's uh, Colorado lows been moving northwest uh, once they cross the uh, Canada-US border? And is this normal or is it uh, a result of climate change? I love how um, knowledgeable our audience is on, uh, on weather. It's a great question. Yes, uh, just briefly, Colorado lows are what we call big low pressure systems that form in Colorado and they ride the jet stream north of the border. That's being the culprit for the big uh, blizzards uh, plural that we've seen in Manitoba this year. But you're right, uh, the pattern has been they cross the border and then they sort of retrograde a little bit westward and they sort of stall out. Um, we, I think we have to look at, look at a multitude of factors. One of them is La Nina, you know, that uh, the cooler than normal equatorial Pacific waters generally means a more active storm pattern across central Canada. So I think that is playing into uh, the the weather that we've seen this spring, we very much have a La Nina in place. But one of my favorite topics right now connecting weather and climate change is the jet stream. And there are more and more studies showing that as the Arctic warms faster 
than uh, the mid latitude areas, uh, that temperature difference is decreasing and it's the temperature difference that fuels the speed of the jet stream. So without that fuel, the jet stream is becoming lazier and loopier and stalling out more. And uh, that may be one of the reasons why we're seeing more prolonged weather events all season round. It's a, it's a topic that I'm really interested in. And I think we're going to hear a lot more about it in the years to come. Uh, Johanna, I will uh, ask you, uh, does climate change make it more difficult to predict the weather? I would say yes, Alex, I would love to talk to you more about this. Um, yeah, it's been interesting. In some cases, it's almost like, you know, a lot of our models are based on historical averages um, and the climate as we know it. And I find sometimes even when I'm looking at you know, the heat domes, these long stretches of drought that we see on the West Coast, after seven days, the model keeps trying to bring a system in. Um, because historically, uh, we do get these little Pacific lows that end the drought. And then you get closer and the model's like, actually, that's not going to happen. And it keeps correcting and correcting. So I'd say our mid-range forecasts are getting more difficult with climate change. And, uh, and we're still figuring out the impact between the two every day. And uh, I, I, I definitely think it's making more challenging. At the same time, our supercomputers are getting better. Our initial conditions are getting better. So I'm hoping that, you know, it's sort of catching up as we go. Yeah, certainly so. I know uh, our chief meteor meteorologist at um, the Weather Network, Chris Scott, he, he tends to describe, you know, climate change as a soup where there are so many different ingredients, you know, already melted into the soup. And while... You know, you taste the general flavor of the soup. It's really hard to pinpoint what the specific ingredients are like sometimes. That. Yeah, like that. That, that was like his that. description of it. <laughs> uh, in the soup, you've had, you know, lots of ingredients, but which, what am I tasting here? You know, is this the dominant, you know, ingredient that's that's coming forth? Uh, so certainly uh, one that we will continue to, to monitor as well. Uh, so I have a, a question here, a bit of a, a curiosity uh, for, for Nevin. Uh, I've never seen a tornado uh, myself, and a lot of people are fascinated by it. And, you know, usually during tornado season, uh, there are storms that are happening, and a lot of people are probably trying to chase themselves. What would be the one piece of advice that you can give to someone who is starting out storm chasing? Well... Um, I, I would say there's a lot of good resources and, and building up that education, uh, was key for me. So I actually took meteorology classes and, and having that, uh, foundational understanding of the atmosphere and respect, I think, uh, really helped my storm chasing in, in saving me from replacing a few windshields and also, um, just having enjoying the chase more more and being safe the entire time so and start small like if there's just a local thunderstorm in your area like that's sub severe you can still have a good time and, and kind of see it from different angles and, and chase right you don't have to go to tornado alley for your first time storm chasing start small definitely some good advice i have a question here uh for uh, alex with uh, climate change so prevalent can we expect, oh, really, that's not the question. Uh, here's the question for Alex, sorry. With this climate change, um, is there any uh, study or observation with regard to animals, flora and fauna in tomogamy or the surrounding area? Yeah, so there is a lot of data on the species that are here now and where they're migrating to. And I just want to highlight um, something that might be relatable for everyone. So everybody is aware of what Lyme disease is and how it's transmitted by ticks. And that's not something that we've seen a lot of in the Tamagami area. But what's been happening is the conditions here have been warming a little bit. And we don't get that sudden cold that, you know, kills off a lot of these like small insects and uh, makes it unfavorable. So the conditions up here have actually been becoming more favorable for these southern species to move up. And what that's called when these species shift northward is a range shift. So they're shifting into these areas that have now become 
accommodating for them that they can survive in. And when you get new species moving in, they can bring things like disease, such as Lyme disease. And that's something that the health unit up here has been aware of. They've been doing tick drags over the summer. So there is a research and there's monitoring going into that. But we're also looking at other invasive species and other species that might be coming up north. Um, so something that also goes with shifting ranges is um, if you're not familiar with the Tomogamy area or Northern Ontario, there's a lot of logging that goes on in these areas. And the species of trees that are being logged, um, you know, we, we replant after the trees are cut down. And the government or um, the people who are replanting these trees use something called assisted migration to help create, you know, hardier forests for those future environmental conditions. It takes, you know, 50 years at least for a tree to grow um, so that it can be harvested again in the future. So we're not just looking at what is the climate going to be in, you know, 10 or 20 years. It's going to be, what is it going to be in 50 years from now? So we need to make sure that the selection of species or the gene pools that are replanted here are appropriate for what those future conditions are going to be so that they can survive to maturity to be reharvested. So there's tons of research going on. There's tons of information that we could talk about forever. Okay, so I have a question here for Johanna uh, with regard to the younger generation and having written uh, several uh, children's books. Uh, in terms of, you know, communicating uh, science to the younger generation and to kids, uh, how would you say would be the best way to start, given the fact that a lot of the younger generation may have a bit of apprehension or fear about climate change and how it will impact them as they move into the future? And that's such a good question because I, I am seeing the younger generations, especially high school students, um, have this eco anxiety, this this environmental anxiety that that you know I didn't necessarily grow up with, and it's not just fears about their future; it's translating to fears about weather. Um, it's been really interesting to see uh, that be a big part of the, uh, the 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 young generations right now. So I would say, um, you know, when talking to them. Uh, first of all, it's listening. You know, where do those fears come from? What is their um, own situation when it comes to climate change? Uh, and really letting them talk about what it is uh, that they're that they're scared about, and then changing that fear. Um, I mean, as Nevin said, a healthy level of fear is is definitely important. But I think understanding the science behind climate change and the connection to weather in a way that younger audiences can understand um, gives them empowerment. And I think um, the more information and knowledge you have about something that scares you, uh, the less that's fear and the more you feel like you understand it and maybe you can do something about it. So it's sort of listening, helping them understand uh, the science of what's happening and then giving them options when it comes to being part of the solution. And I don't think it's a one size fits all solution. What I'm hearing a lot about talking to environmental psychologists, which is a growing field, is that uh, being attached to some kind of a solution, depending on your personality, can really help with that anxiety. So, you know, whether it's being a part of a neighborhood project to uh, plant more trees, or it's showing up to rallies if you're more of a social person and finding ways to connect your audience is, is really important. When I'm talking to really, really young audiences, which is where um, my books are pointed, I like to actually uh, anthropomorphize things like clouds and pine cones. Um, actually, my new book coming out, Alex, I love that you brought this up, is about a jack uh, pine cone who needs wildfire for her seeds to open up. So if you're talking to really young audiences, it's making a fun story about it while um, you know, taking them on a science journey. But I'm always open to new ways to talk to young people. Yeah, I think that's really important. Thank you so much, Joanna. The the sense of, you know, our personal empowerment uh, that we can help mitigate and perhaps it might not seem or be as daunting if we can be more proactive. Thank you. And next question, I think I'll uh, pass this one over to, uh, to Nevin. Uh, so the question here is, I've often seen a dark ripple, quote unquote, in clouds before a thunderstorm hits uh, in Regina. Uh, what is this caused by? Hmm. I'm not sure what the dark ripple refers to. Yeah, you need to send a picture, but um, I, I'm assuming it's it's if, if, if I'm imagining like Regina and the, and the storms that come through, there's a lot of like shelf clouds 
uh, or, or like large kind of boundaries between different, two different air masses that kind of come through when these storms come through. And you can get some really spectacular striations, we call them. And uh, so I'm thinking that that's what maybe it's, it's, it's kind of like, okay, uh, ripples like a butterscotch ripple and a vanilla ice cream. Yes, striations. Yeah. So um, yeah, that's a good way to describe it. Um, some of these storms, if they're supercells or, or even really big shelf clouds can have these kind of like pancake stack looks. And I think that uh, that's just from that wind shear that we talked about a little bit and, and how it's working with the storm kind of creates those, those lines, which is really cool to see. So it's, it's one of the reasons that draws me out there as a, as a storm chaser for sure. Well, thank you so much. I have a bit of a question here, just uh, on my own uh, curiosity. When you're chasing storms or in your history of chasing storms, how many tornadoes have you documented? Oh, yeah. Um, our team tried to count at one point, but we lost count, I think, at 200. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that, that is impressive. That is definitely impressive. Um, how long have you been uh, chasing storms, Nevin? Uh, me personally, I don't know. It's always hard to pick exactly when it started, but uh, probably over 12 years. And yeah. That is definitely impressive. Well, uh, we've had some uh, great questions that have come in, and uh, it was definitely a very lively and educational uh, discussion. And I would like to thank our three panelists, Alexandra Clark of Tomogamy First Nation, Joanna Wagstaff of CBC, and Nevin of uh, Prairie Storm Chasers. Thank you so much to the three of you. And uh, we look forward to collaborating with you, you know, in the future and all of the good work and looking forward to that book, Joanna. <laughs> Oh, <laughs>